these bodies were filled with stories and filled with energy and also filled with quiet. What if our biggest obstacle to bringing our fiery passion selves isn't that we're not audacious enough to steal the Promethean fire, but that it's not safe to hold on to the fire once we have it? Bringing our full passionate selves is scary. Do our bosses and coworkers have space for us, or will we unintentionally send someone? Today I'm talking to Everett Harper about how he creates a strong container for bringing fire into his company Trust, which solves some of the world's hardest technical problems. Everett isn't just an extraordinarily talented CEO, he's also a deeply embodied human. His poise comes from being a Hall of Fame soccer champion from Duke, a yoga teacher, tango dancer, and king of carnival. In dance, you learn to find your own center of gravity so that you can hold a frame, a stable but flexible confidence that telegraphs to your dance partner where you're headed to next. Holding fire in your workplace and home feels like exactly the same substance to me. So many things we could talk about, Everett. Hi. We've known each other a long time. It really actually hasn't been that long. It has not been that long. I was going to correct you for that. Uh, it has not been that long, but we, we go deep early. It feels like I've known you all my life, even mm. though it's actually been about two years, three years um, at the most. We met on a boat. We met on a boat summit. It would have been 2015. Yeah. 2015. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we danced in the middle of the rain and... And uh, drew a crowd. Did we? <laughs> we did. Are you serious? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't even know this. Yeah, I remember that. I remember <laughs> there was definitely a group of people who were standing at the edge of, a, edge of the dance floor. And as we were dancing and, and so forth, there were a couple people who were clearly just entertained <laughs> by us. And there was sort of like a half <laughs> ring or a three-quarter <laughs> ring. Oh, it was one of my most memorable meetings because <laughs> after we'd been dancing for what felt like infinity time that could have been between five minutes and two hours, mm -hmm. you leaned over and said, hi. And I was like, that's the best high of my life. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. So with that introduction. Um, hi. Hi. <laughs> um, what's most alive for you in this moment? Well, um I think the the that meditation practice and yoga actually had I mean I've been I read the miracle of mindfulness in 1992 and was a yoga teacher for a while and so forth and it's not to say my practice is perfect but the kind of repeated training of sitting in one place is always been has always been something that I know how to do. And because the way Thich Nhat Hanh kind of framed his philosophy in that book, not philosophy, his practice in that book, wash the dishes to wash the dishes was the thing that was literally the, the phrase that nearly made me wash, drop the dishes. <laughs> but that, that realization that meditation is accessible at any time. You don't have to go to a monastery. You don't have to go to the woods. You can do it right here talking to you. I can do it washing dishes. I can do it while, while watering the plants. I can do it in an intense conversation if I'm good enough. Yep. That's where you get to. Yeah. And so that was how I got introduced to meditation. That's how I practiced meditation. And especially being before I even became busy, busy CEO person, um, but being a dad, pfft, uh, you better learn how to meditate while your kid is crying inconsolably because uh, you'll be doing the same thing, right? Um, but being able to, to, to step out of it any given moment and step into something that moves at glacial time uh, is a practice that I'm really familiar with, no matter how good I am or not, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that's the, even when you said, you know, good practice, bad practice. It's like, it's just practice. It's just practice. If you pick up a paintbrush and put some paint on a paper, you are painting. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about if you are a painter. Yep. Yep. Just be painting. Yep. So anyway, that that's a common experience for me. 
I love that. I love that. I, I think that's it is not talked about enough in that way. It is. I've, I'm feeling this real anger about this concept of self care. This capitalistic sense of self care is something you can purchase for yourself. Like mm-hmm. you can go purchase for yourself. And I'm not saying it's wrong to purchase any of these things. Don't get me wrong. You can purchase for yourself self care of a massage and a therapist and a yoga retreat and all these things are lots of dollars mm-hmm. and and they are great things to spend money on mm-hmm. and I have and will continue to and at the same time self care at the deepest most real level non optional <laughs> level is managing your energy saying no to things that you regret like that's the real fucking shit and it doesn't cost a dime yeah right right it costs you time but it doesn't cost a dime uh, it might even free up your time though yeah. so yeah. Um, and yes, I completely agree. I mean, I think in another life, um, in another life, the access to this for people, uh, of color, people who are low, who, who don't have a lot of means, um, it, I mean, that is revolutionary, life-changing, whatever, um, and it's and there are people who really who who tap into that. There's a, for example, there's a um, black Buddhist uh, sangha every Thursday here in Oakland, um, and the levels are all over the place. I taught a yoga class in Anacostia in D.C. with these women, ranging probably from age thirty five forty to seventy, and it's completely different than the sort of yoga body type of a thing that. Uh, is purported on magazines, Completely. but these bodies were filled with yeah. stories and filled with energy and also filled with quiet. And these folks, I mean, it definitely the, the, the cliche of you get more out of teaching the class than, than the people who received it, but being able to kind of see how, well, they earned that quiet. And then they reflected it back mm. with all sorts of wisdom, just in the way that they moved and mm. just in the way they stood and the way they brought other things out of the class. So that stuff, as you said, that's accessible for free. Um, and it is simple, like sit on a bloody mat and, and close your eyes or breathe a little bit can be for 10 minutes in a library in Anacostia. Mm -hmm. And that's about, if that's the self-care you get, if you Mm -hmm. do that every day, you're going to be ahead of most people, including me. A little back history of your life. And I would love it if you would touch on your mother a little bit as well. Mm. Sure. Um, So back history, Uh, born and raised in the Hudson Valley of New York. First uh, generation to go to college in my family. My mom and dad both are from the uh, Homewood uh, neighborhood in Pittsburgh. Go Westinghouse High. Um, And they moved up there, up to the Hudson Valley, um, to go work for IBM. And my mom was a homemaker, um, largely by herself in there. Dads didn't really help that much. And um, <clears throat> had three kids. I'm the oldest. And uh, midway through my third grade year, she decided to be a secretary uh, at IBM, go back to work, not supported by dad. Um, and then after about two years, saw a little trend because all those people bringing punch cards and um, tape uh, loops um, into IBM and then out of IBM were talking not about like big university experiments or science stuff, but they're talking about running logistics and shipping and things like that. And she's like, this computer thing is going to run the world. I think I want to be a programmer. And there's something incredibly, uh, uh, audacious about a black woman with a high school education who was not good at math to say, I want to be a programmer in the midst of a very different and mostly white environment. And skipping to the end, um, she uh, failed her first test and then was able to take it again, passed, and that was 25 years as an IBM programmer doing assembly language would would make your head spin. Uh, 
I didn't unfortunately know this when I was in high school. I learned about this about five years ago. And so I say this part of the story because it really influenced a lot of the way that I think about things, but not in my awareness. I grew up in an IBM town. Yeah. I just want to interrupt to say if anybody wants to read the full story, you have a column on Forbes. Yeah. Yeah. Which is very good. And all that can be found. Yeah. It's we'll uh, put links in the notes. I put it as Hidden Genius uh, in Forbes under Everett Harper. You can find it. And it's about my mom. I published it on Mother's Day. So oh. I thought I was going to be a good son. Um, you are a good son. So quick, quick on me. So uh, biomedical engineering and electrical engineering in college, which taught me that I'm not a born engineer because there are some. Um, but, um, while I was there, got a really good education anyway, and was able to be on the national championship soccer team, uh, a dream that I always had playing 90 minutes in the final. Uh, it's, I appreciate it now more than I did then (laughs) because it's hard. It's hard to be the last people standing because it doesn't have anything to do with justice. (laughs) It has everything to do with who's better on that particular day and a lot of luck. Mm. A lot of hard work, obviously, but um, it has nothing to do with justice. Um, went to Bain. I remember the day Mitt Romney walked in the Bain offices, starting Damn. Bain Capital. Um, and then I worked for a, a company called Self Help, which is called uh, Self Help Credit Union, which is uh, one of the preeminent uh, economic development organizations uh, in the United States, a brilliant, uh, founder, uh, Martin Eeks, and, um, they do amazing works. And I feel very fortunate to have been there when there was only 17 people. And now it's billions of dollars of assets, um, focused on promoting home ownership for low and moderate income communities, um, and really foundational work. Um, then went, um, oh, yes, then started my first company doing diversity training, um, did uh, all sorts of things under death threats occasionally. What? Um, oh, yeah. Um, uh, we were merging the, uh, helping to merge the Durham City and County School Districts. Oh, You can imagine, shit. yeah, you, you're from the South, so you know oh, exactly what that damn. means. damn. People show up with... People show up with all sorts of things. And, I was going to you know, say pitchforks, but. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, and this is an era where, you know, in 1980, there was a, there was a shootout between the Klan and a workers, communist workers party, uh, rallies. Um, that couple people got shot. Um, so that was only an hour away from this area. And, uh, this was much later, but those scars are still there and the people are still there and Charlottesville proves that it hadn't gotten away. So we were able to facilitate, we had a role in facilitating between the leadership of these, these two entities and it was intense. It was ultimately scary and thrilling because we were doing the real deal. We were getting people behind closed doors and they didn't have to represent their groups like they did if they were on a public dais. And there's a lot of shared community amongst these folks. And getting that dialogue going and being vulnerable in the moment and then placing yourself in between this energy going around and trying to really redirect it is hard and absolutely lights you up. Mm. Um, and, it, and, and, you know, at the end of the day, it, it merged no major dramas and so forth. And I mean, it was definitely one of those moments where m- myself and the team were just wrung out and know that we had created a legacy that still exists. So that was cool. Um, fast forwarding, I came out to, uh, to start an organizational behavior graduate school program at uh, Stanford. Um, so I didn't want to be a professor and did an MBA and a master of education instead. Uh, and, uh, but I still have my foot in social psychology, which is a lot of what I'm drawing mm-hmm. from this mm-hmm. conversation. Did a bunch of startups, um, uh, including Second Life, um, which was an amazing experience. And the biggest thing is I met my two co-founders of my company, Trust, uh, and we're infrastructuralists, infrastructuralists. 
And we um, founded this in 2011, a uh, consultancy really helping startup scale and a uh, large company do their digital transformation, but focused on the infrastructure, which includes people, systems, and operations. Um, and it's been fun. It's been a hell of fun. You like hard problems. I do. <laughs> I do. Um, I, yeah, I'm glad you said that because I, you know, I had said that in my head several times. The company does as well. And it's kind of like, I realize I have a high tolerance for ambiguity. And I think if you're going to be in these kinds of problems, you have to have some pretty core part of you that's comfortable there. Mm -hmm. um, because they don't, they don't lend themselves to easy solutions or quick ones. Um, and you're wrong a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. How do you make space in a group dynamic for that kind of fire of, you know, like you said, that these hard problems, they light you up. Mm. And when you've got a room full of people and everybody's lit up, like mm. hopefully that is the situation because everybody's fully engaged mm -hmm. in it, mm -hmm. right? Like we want these lives of passion. We want our workplaces to be places that we can come to solve these things that our heart calls us to but what do you do when you're in a room full of people that are all lit up and maybe yeah it's not all in the same direction mm, it's probably not uh so i think it starts before the moment part of it is setting up a a process uh and checkpoints beforehand knowing either trying to create that fire or knowing how to deal with it when it happens. Um, so part of it's structural. Um, part of it, and, and a large part of it, is creating the space for people to do that. And space creation is not something you just say, I'm going to create space. It's, it's structural. And you think about it and you, and you, you, you reinforce it. And you make it safe for people to have space, which is sort of an odd thing to think about. But I, I, in my theory, you know, people probably are so used to not having space that when given space, what do you do? Am I the first person at the party? You know what I mean? It's, it induces all sorts of like strange yeah. out of out of context experiences. And then making it safe for the people to say, yeah, you're just here. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to prove anything. You don't have to do anything. So that's the first thing. So it's structural. Second thing is the trainers. I was trained with another person. I didn't try and do it on my own. And partly you have to do the work ahead of time. What does it feel like to be on fire? What does it feel like to have your partner on fire? When do you know they're on fire and in trouble versus when you're on fire and just keep them going? Um, and then being able to recognize that in other people, in other people. So those things have to happen beforehand. I'm thinking of, um, this is going to be a, a slight aside, um, the musicians call it the pocket, where mm -hmm. you're in this groove and magic is happening. And I remember playing, I played flute growing up and jazz and stuff like that. And you're in the pocket and you're trying to hold it. And I'm playing flute, so I can't like move my <laughs> mouth or say yay or anything. Like yeah. I have to hold my technique. Um, and it's so exciting and no one wants to break it. No one wants to force it or shy away from it. You have to hold that tension. It's this middle allowing. It's and the then, middle way. I mean, I actually think that's a beautiful illustration of the middle path of Buddha. That it is this, you know, if the string is too loose on a guitar, mm -hmm. it just drags. And if it's too tight, it's screechy, yep. like too high. So you have to find that not trying trying to not try, just yep. allowing, but not being slack at the same time. That's right. That's right. And then you have to hold it with a group, which gets back to your question. Um, once you have a structure, once you create safety, once you can recognize when people are lit up, someone, it's not going to happen all at once. It's going to happen with a person. You create a little bit of safety, someone lights up. You make sure that that person gets recognized, but not put on the spot. Is is sort of brought up and also brought back down. You don't leave them hanging. Now everybody who's moved by that story sees, oh, they took care of that person. I can be that person next time, or I can just simply feel it. 
Mm-hmm. They're not going to single me out. Awesome. Then you have enough of those things happening in a room. The stories come out. The experiences happen. People are allowed to be moved. I allow myself to be moved. And then there's sort of a building of that. And often you can, one can structure that moment or those moments or the spaces where many people are feeling it at the same time. And then they start to take care of each other. Mm. And when I know mm-hmm. I'm on is they start to take care of each other. And then I'm just facilitating a much bigger space of energy. The second, the, the, so that's how I do it in an organized way. The best trainers I know, however, and occasionally I would do, I could get there, um, know when they need to rip up the, rip up the script. When you have something presented to you, where everybody's already lit up, but it's all over the place. Mm. There was an incident at Duke. I was doing a workshop between blacks and Jews on campus. And there was a, like a, maybe a 60 minute story about Duke. And they sort of misrepresented a lot of people's um, um, viewpoints. And I heard beforehand that, um, you know what? We turned this from the leader of the organization so this thing came out and word got out that we're doing this workshop and I know you all can do this. We decided to kind of like invite a whole bunch of people so people might be lit up. The place was packed. We had to go to a completely different hall to have three times as many people. So we're sitting in wow. front of about 150, 200 people, all like crazy wow. yeah. wanting to talk, appropriately wanting to talk. And um, we basically stood in front and we said, you know, we had a program and we're not going to do the program. We're going to do this. And we kind of set some things up to get the fire out that was all over the place first. Then to take what was in the room and start to double back and say, okay, we've heard this. We see this. It's represented of many people in the room. You look at, you know, the, the nodding up and down. And then you start to weave what you're originally going to say into the context that they've already given you. And that's hard. I mean, it's hard to like, it's, it's a little bit of improv, but it's really, I think at core, if I'm thinking about now, you have to listen first, acknowledge first, I mean, acknowledge second, which creates space and safety. And then you have the ability to start directing that energy in either productive or new or directional ways. And then probably give up the idea that you're the expert and you have a goal in mind with mm-hmm. that big a group. There's no mm-hmm. goal. There's mm-hmm. no goal. It's this is a space where we all have come together and we get to hear each other in a time that's a crisis. There will be a smaller group that actually can do something um, effective and meaningful and non-destructive. But for now, it's a space for us to kind of just commune in whatever feelings you might be having. That's lovely. I love moving away from goal because you never can predict what is going to emerge from those conversations. And if you yeah. think you can, you will prevent it from emerging. Not only you prevent it from emerging, but as soon as the audience understands that you're trying to prevent it from emerging, they will fight you and they will take you down. Yeah, it's not going to go how you think it will. That's the only thing we know for sure. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And if you put yourself in front of the flood, then (laughs) you're the object in the way and they're going to come right at you. And that, I mean, in, in, in many ways, I mean, just kind of broadening it to other contexts. If you're the CEO, if you're a speaker at a conference... Um, if you're leading a group in a, in a workshop or brainstorming or design thing, whatever it happens to be, if you stand in the way of the energy that's in the room, you know, there's a certain amount of time that you, you get, you get a break because you are the quote unquote leader. And then you become the object and they come right at you. And God help you there. (laughs) (laughs) You better be. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. I love it. Um, I'm really loving that we're talking about fire and what I desperately want to pick your brain about for my own selfish interest is, you know, I feel like you have done an incredibly good job of running an agency that 
draws people because you're very heart connected and loving and you're an amazing leader and I haven't met very many of your team but the ones that I have are are the same so I'm curious how you think about in your within your company meetings not so much in a public meeting how those sort of dynamics of people showing up in their full dragon selves yeah. Yeah. <laughs> how do you bring it out in a productive way and align it with the realities of your business yeah um great question um myself and my two founders mark for jen leach they should be named um we early on we've we've all been the beneficiaries of being an organization with very strong cultures most have been good some yeah, had some edges we all have some edges but some of them weren't, weren't so good but the point is that we knew that establishing and understanding what the culture is that we wanted would both attract and repel people we'd want to repel the people who actually shouldn't be part of the organization that's a really um, important yeah. aspect like absolutely you definitely want to be turning some people away when you write down your values if they sound like they could be anybody else's values and they would be okay with everybody you have not written your values that's right go back to you the do not there. know what your values are that's right completely <laughs> agree and 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 it should simultaneously attract the others and by the way it's your first recruiting tool <laughs> and it's the cheapest thing that you can do because um, getting people through an interview pipeline and then finding out there's a value match a year after you've hired them is a completely avoidable problem. Um, anyway, so that's the first thing. We spent early on when a lot of advice in the Silicon Valley would be, don't spend time on values, just do the work. Um, I think that's bullshit. Um, we sat down after hours for three months for two and a half hour, two to two and a half hours each week with a facilitator to go through our values to that's a big investment yeah it was I think it was three months it was at least two months um, and what we wanted to do was both brain you know we sort of opened it up brainstorm discovery what is what is the things that we we appreciate by the way and there's a risk that we find out as founders, we've already mm. been in a company. We've already have we already have people. Ooh, just about I, I think that. six or nine. I think we had like nine people at that time. Um, you could find out that your co-founder and you have a set of values that are in conflict. I think that's the most important, the most significant reason that people don't do this work, oh, and yeah. they do not even. It's an unconscious uh, block in themselves. You know, if you ask them why they're not doing it, they'll give you 17 reasons and none of them will be the real reason. And mm -hmm. the real reason is they don't want to know. They don't want to know. They don't want to have it be revealed and they don't want to see if there's a conflict. Because they're attached to it working. It's got to work. This has got to work. Right. It's got to work. Right. And, you know, in, I would I would guess to say empirically, but at least in my own experience, uh, of the companies that were founded around the same time that I did, uh, that we did, um, the people who failed didn't fail because of a lack of a business idea. Most of them failed because the founding team or the early team conflict, mm -hmm. like fundamental conflict. And that was true of my business as well. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Exactly, exactly. I spent so much of my energy trying to resolve issues with my co-founder to the point that I was, I was engaging with a coach and at one point she says to me, do you understand that every meeting we have had for the last six months has been your relationship with your co-founder? Yep. You haven't asked me about managing your new employees. You've never done this before. You've never done that before. You've never done that. You know, I haven't talked about customers development. Like mm -hmm. we haven't talked about anything but your relationship with your co-founder. Yep. 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 Uh, I believe it. And uh, we've, we've had, uh, I've heard similar advice when hiring senior people uh, from HR folks saying, basically paraphrase, if you um, have a particular person that comes up in your exec meeting or whatever, more than four times in two months, you're avoiding the real conversation, which that person probably needs to be moved or let go. Because mm -hmm. uh, if you're still talking about that person in six months, yep. you failed yep. as a leader, period. And I was like, ooh. ooh. 
peppers, but that's you know, good. like, that's good. Ooh, that's somewhere good. deep in your body, you know that's true. Even you if know, you don't right. want to know it, that's I right. don't want to know it. That's right. <laughs> and all you have to do is look at your records of your meetings, and if that person's name is on it every time, yeah, you don't need to know it. You can just read it. Um, so going back to the to the thing, um, but that kind of I just want to stop yeah, though please, because that ahead. is actually one of those moments where keeping people like that puts the fire out in the organization or lights it up in the wrong way. That's fair. That's I'm it. sort of using fire as like the universally good creative force mm -hmm. that's in your body, and anxiety also sort of feels like that uh, that enliveningness, mm -hmm. but it's more like I feel like that anxiety over. Oh, there's this relationship with my co-founder. It, it, that anxiety is energy that is motivating you to do the thing that you don't want to do. Mm -hmm. It's still energy to move in the direction that your heart's actually calling you, but right. you just won't let it happen. So they both, the fire is really the same kind of thing, but they're definitely come from two different. Um, one is I am aligned with my purpose and I am on it and the universe is helping me and the other is like, I'm trying to row my boat upstream. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and I mean, it's sort of like my favorite, one of my favorite phrases, it's not a superpower unless it could be used for good and evil or evil. Yeah. And for me, if I, you know, kind of, if you don't remove a person who is toxic to the environment, um, it reduces the fire of other people because they look and they're wondering, why are you not getting rid of this person? I can't do my best work. And mm -hmm. I thought you hired me to do my best work. Yep. It also can light up a fire in, in people saying, I'm going to fight this. Mm -hmm. And now you've got two different conflicts, one internal to some of your employees that isn't being spoken. Right. And one external is you have a battle between two people and it, the whole thing, you know, has a tendency to burn your organization down. Um, yeah, so we want to get ahead of that, of course. Um, so, yes, we invited, invested in values. We invested in making them clear. We spent a lot of time wordsmithing because we wanted, again, to attract the right people, repel the wrong people. And we wanted to, uh, our mantra was, this is not an IBM poster. This was not <laughs> something we would put on the walls. And, uh, and so uh, it's got to be active. So we have six values. And then we have three practices underneath. And the practices are really important because it aligns and it can be enacted in anybody's daily work. So, um, you know, build alliances is one of them. And then work shoulder to shoulder with clients. That's really easy for somebody who's new in the organization to enact. And it's concrete. And it's concrete. So... You can tell because, look, our shoulders are next to each other. Right, right, right. The, the um, show up, step up is another one of them. And there's a couple of practices underneath that around showing up and stepping up. You know, do the best move, not the easiest one, you know. Um, for people who are used to kind of skating along. Because, you know, and by the way, I'm not going to say that that's necessarily a bad thing. Because maybe they have other priorities in their life. Mm -hmm. But that's not what we're trying to do. If we're trying to solve hard, hard problems... I need you to do your best work and I'll do everything I can to help you do your best work. Um, but if skating is your thing, if skating is your best work, go skate somewhere else. I mean, there, else. there's, yeah. there's, there's actually there. I'm not even throwing shade. Like there literally are companies where that is a perfect match exactly. for their culture. Exactly. Exactly. And, and great. You, we're doing everybody a favor to find Absolutely. the right matches between people. We're trying to take on hard problems and so we need, we need something different. Um, so, uh, and then, um, how we enact that in, so that was the first thing, set the values. Two, we have different meetings. Your original question is like, how do you do this in like meetings and places that are private to you, but not to the public? Um, I think the, 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 we have retros as a company. And retros, for, for folks who, who don't know, retros are this really wonderful process where we do it every six weeks or so, but essentially you do a formalized feedback with the entire group. Ten minutes, write down everything that's been great for the last six weeks. Ten minutes to discuss, I'm uh, sorry, a little bit of time to vote. Everybody puts them on yellow stickies mm. to avoid sort of the group think brainstorm <sighs> bullshit. You put it on yellow stickies, everybody reads them out. And then you vote yes, with, sti with stickers 
um, which ones you want to discuss. Dot voting. Yep. So you get like three dots per person. One dot per person. One dot per person. Oh, no, sorry. Two dots per person. And we usually wind up with like three or four that people uh, coalesce, uh, coalesce around. And then we have 10 minutes to discuss them. And it's great because... This you is like a million things. times better than the usual. I've got to do performance reviews once a year, and not all these people ask me to do a performance review, and that's such a broken fucked it's up process. A, yeah, it's, it's stupid. It's, it's really. It's, it's really not bad. often enough, mm-hmm. and it's written down in this form. Like there's just nothing real about anything. Yeah, yeah. I have opinions. You do. <laughs> uh, so, so that's the first part, and then the second part is you take twenty minutes. To write 15 or 20 minutes to write down all the things that weren't working, things that need to be improved, things that went poorly. Um, you write those down, put them on sticky, same thing, you vote. Um, uh, importantly, you don't have the senior people with more votes Ooh. or deciding. Ooh, that's real. And for you know, for those who are like, ooh, that's scary. Well, what's scarier is that you don't know what the heck is going on with your organization two or three levels down. Yep. This is the one of the most efficient ways I've seen to understand actually what's happening at the various levels of your organization. And you don't hear about it otherwise. Um, then you get a discussion. And what's great about that is sometimes you see a lot of people coalescing to this one issue. Oh, I don't even care what the discussion is. I know that's something I need to pay attention to because there's so much energy around it. That starts to bring in fire because if you put in one thing and you don't know whether anybody else is feeling the same way and mm-hmm. then you have eight people feel the same way, mm-hmm. that lights you up. Yeah. That means I feel like I'm heard. It means that I've seen something that other people have seen and you're excited because now we get to talk about that thing. So that's that's definitely I'm, a thing. I'm yeah. curious if you've, in these meetings, discovered... Any trend on, like, are there people in your organization who have sort of a gift of foresight for seeing those things that everybody else is likely to also coalesce on, but they see see them Mm, earlier? I don't think there's anyone who consistently consistently has it on every dimension. There have been times where people have have had their finger on a particular vein Mm -hmm. over a short period you know a couple yeah. months of time um yeah there's no shortcuts you have to do the process yeah oh yeah absolutely absolutely finally by the way to close the retro process and this is important um once discussion happens you reserve the last 10 minutes for actions so the may rather than trying to solve the issue or problem in the moment which is very difficult yeah very difficult to do say uh, when people get into solution mode, hey, let's take an action and we'll put it at the end, right? Okay, continue discussing. Yep. Because you really want to get as many yeah. of the issues out. Yep. You take actions at the end. You assign them to people, including saying, you know what? We're going to defer that. It's imp- it's We discussed it. We want it as an action. But can anybody take that on for the next three months? If not, defer it. And we keep records of it, but uh, you don't want to wind up acting on things that you actually can't make progress on or too early or whatever. Um, so at the end of it, you have action items around good things and bad things uh, in a really, and assigned, you put them in your process. And by the next retro, you check whether those stuff got, that the stuff got done. That lights people up because they feel heard. They get corroboration. If it's important enough, it gets action. And there's accountability. Mm-hmm. And you cannot stop without the accountability. I think I it's very easy for me to do all the steps except for the accountability step. Absolutely. It's so, oh, God, I love going towards the future. I hate accountability. I hate holding people accountable. Mm-hmm. But, but we, you have to. But you have to, and there's a couple it people. It really changes. We, you said, there's, are, are there people who kind of can see what's happening in the organization? Well, actually, what is resonant for me now is there's a couple people who who can see accountability Mm -hmm. like they hold people they regularly and sometimes gently sometimes forthrightly hold people accountable like hey did we do the things that we said we were going to do last time Mm -hmm. okay why not okay is there something broken in our process 
that we're assigning too many things. That's where the defer came from. Is yeah. this person sort of pushing on, well, why aren't we doing, why do we only do 50% of the things we said we were going to do? What's the point of saying we're going to do them if only half of them get done? Mm -hmm. Defer it mm -hmm. or do it. Yeah. And or, I, or say we're not going to do it. Yeah. And that's, that's a fine answer. And so that person is incredibly valuable. Super valuable. And they can look like they're a pain in the ass. So you have to really make space for them to hold you probably as a founder even accountable. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, and, and the thing is... See them as the gift that they are. Well, they, I mean, I think they're recognized as the gift they are. And they don't... The way that this person goes about it is not why didn't finger point absolutely. you do this? Absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, I noticed that we only did 50% of the things that we said we were going to do. Absolutely. They could all be mine by the way and sometimes they are, right? Um but he's saying as an organization, if we are going to be great, we have to be able to understand what we can do, what we can't do, and what we're going to do later. And be clear and make sure that we understand that for everybody. That's a great organization. Yep. Um, because what it does, and, 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 and even going with one step further, and this, going one step further, if you realize that you can't get to something, then something else is broken and you may actually be able to understand, we need to hire somebody. Yeah. Or we need to do less of other things because this is more important. That's the real solution. That's the real the real learning that changes your company. Because I hate the moment of accountability. It does not come naturally to me. But it, this, is, this is the loop. And if you only get two-thirds of the way around the loop and you don't finish it, then you're missing the value of the whole That's right. process. That's, That's right. when it becomes... Like, don't get me wrong. Steps one and two will already change your organization in massive and wonderful ways. But the minute you finish the loop, you get that greater than the sum of its parts Absolutely. aspect. Absolutely. Yeah. And so in some ways, I think going back all to the beginning, this retro is 10 minutes, you know, good, the bad, the actions. And then the loop is created in the next retro when you start with, did we do the things that we said we were going to do? That is the feedback loop. Yep. And is, I'm sure you and everybody who's listening understands how important feedback loops are to learning, um, completing that cycle. And by the way, in going back to your theme of lighting people up with fire, when, when it seems silly in the moment, but when I'm thinking about it, how important it is, when you're retros, everybody can say, yep, I did this, I did it, mm -hmm. we did all the things. Look, we did it! Everybody gets a little kind of jazz. Yeah, totally. And and just the simple fact of saying that we've done the things that we deemed important six weeks ago and we did them. Feels great. Feels really, really good. Awesome. So we're coming to the end of our time. Wow, that An went quick. goes so fast. I'm curious if you, I'm looking through your bookshelf and you have some of my favorite books. Not even, I didn't even recommend some of the ones that are my favorite books that you found them anyway uh like lisa feldman's barrett's how motions are made um our friend ellen petri leanne's mm -hmm. happiness hack i'm curious if you have a book that you would recommend that sort of talks about this retro process because it's so beautiful well uh, a little bit of a shout out to my colleagues at trust we wrote a blog post about this on on trust.works blog look up retros i think it's called well met um, but look that up. It's a great summary about the way that we particularly do it. Various people do it differently. Um, in terms of other books I'd recommend on sort of similar topics, I mean, Thinking Fast and Slow is an all-time classic. Um, all the psychological principles in many ways that we've talked about, I think in much of them are encapsulated in, in, in Kahneman's book. Um, I continue to look, oh, Quiet. This is a different one. Quiet by Susan Cain is about introverts and how introverts see the world and how the world sees introverts and how the world is really optimized for extroversion. I have a company full of introverts 
This process of retros works for them mostly, there's a little edgy, because an introvert will not raise their hand often, well, tends not to raise their hand in big groups environments. So being able to write their thoughts down and put them on a piece of paper is so critically important to getting their voices out, recognized, and heard. An organized process like a retro, where you facilitate how people talk, provides containers for introverts to participate rather than a free-for-all of a brainstorming discussion or, or whatever. There's opportunity, There's important things about sometimes brainstorming, but this that book is really, really good for understanding how to get the best contributions from introverts and also recognize how extroverts need to pull back some mm-hmm. to create space for others. Uh, I think... Oh, and I think Artist Way. I had to be dragged kicking and screaming to reading that book. I heard about it in my 20s. A good friend uh, and and big love, Michelle Turner, said, Every you need to read this, every you need to read this, every you need to read this. And finally I did. And what's great about that book is it is a process of writing to kind of peel away different layers to recognize where that fire comes from, and particularly when you snuff it out yourself. Mm-hmm. Not when anybody else snuffs Nobody it out. Nobody does it as much as we do it to ourselves. Exactly. And there are ways, there are things that we do unconsciously, the things that we do consciously. And going through that book has helped me develop a practice um, of writing every day, of a gratitude practice, and writing the gratitude practice, um, that really can light me up when I'm doing it on a regular basis. Uh, so I highly recommend that process because I think um, the repetitive nature of it and the container that the author creates is very similar to the kind of things that we try and create at Trust, um, which is space internally for you doing your best work and space to connect with others in doing their best work. And that book has a lot of those elements. Beautiful. Mm. Well, we'll end it on that. All right. Thanks. You're welcome. That was Everett Harper of Trust. If you'd like to work for such an extraordinary leader, check out their jobs page at trust.works. Next week, we're going to be dropping the bonus episode from the Dent Conference where he gave a talk entitled Move to the Edge and Declare at Center, which is his complexity framework. Thanks to Point and Passing for our music and get more of that at Non, the sound meditation app for iPhone. And lastly, if you just can't get enough Chris, there's the Love Lock card deck at chrisbeasley.com c-r-i-s-b-e-a-s-l-e-y dot com see you next time